Coming up on this Friday edition of Daybreak, a new poll finds 70% of South Koreans support the idea of a reunified Korea. The Korean government will convene a special meeting to work out ways to counter illegal Chinese fishing in Korea's exclusive economic zone. Plus, addressing racial tensions in the United States, President Barack Obama says that too many Americans feel there's a deep unfairness about the way laws are enforced on a day-to-day -day basis. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Friday, December 5th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Brew and you're tuned in to Daybreak. Our top story this morning, Korea is seeking out ways to take bold action against illegal Chinese fishing in Korean waters. The ruling Senuri party and officials from relevant government ministries will convene later today to discuss ways to improve countermeasures. An official at the National Assembly says the government has not done enough to protect the domestic fishing industry. Korean fishermen have been calling on the government to strengthen its monitoring and crack down as Chinese fishing boats have been illegally entering Korea's exclusive economic zone in larger and larger numbers over the last few years. They also want the authorities to widen the scope of their patrols all the way down Korea's coastline. Hundreds of Chinese fishermen are arrested each and every year for illegally fishing in Korean waters and they often react violently, often very violently, when Coast Guard officers approach their vessels. The bodies of eight more victims in the sinking of a Korean fishing vessel off Russia's Far Eastern coast were recovered on Thursday. This brings the confirmed death toll to 20, 33 are still missing. According to the vessel's owner, the boat appeared to lose balance after water flooded in and blocked a drain on the boat as search and rescue operations continue in that very tough part of the world. Korea will send dispatch, uh, rather, two patrol planes and a patrol ship to the site of the sinking. President Park Geun-hye has said that the reunification of the two Koreas would be a bonanza for the Korean peninsula. And while everyone in South Korea might not have such strong convictions as the president, given the uh, mind-boggling costs and other economic and social issues that will probably arise, seven out of ten South Koreans do support the idea of a unified Korea. Our Kim Min-ji reports. Unification of the two Koreas would be a bonanza words spoken by the South Korean president. But what do the average South Koreans think? Believe it or not, 7 in 10 people say we need unification. This according to a survey by the Seoul-based Korea Institute for National Unification on 1,000 people nationwide. Then why do they think unification is needed? Nearly 40 percent of respondents said it was because North and South Koreans belong to the same race. Eliminating the threat of war came in second, followed by reuniting families separated by the Korean War and becoming an advanced nation. While not many South Koreans see unification as a benefit to themselves as an individual, they believe that it would be a boon for the country as a whole. If and when the two Koreas do become one, the respondents said their top agenda should be working to achieve greater economic growth. Experts say the GDP of a unified Korea could reach 70,000 U.S. dollars by 2050, the second highest among G20 nations. While the report shows public sentiment is largely behind unification, many South Koreans were still apprehensive when it came to the idea of moving to the North for work or marriage, indicating there is still a way to go before they feel totally comfortable about their northern neighbors. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. Now, in uh, political news regarding inter-Korean issues, South Korea has expressed its willingness to return to the long-stalled six-party talks aimed at 
denuclearizing North Korea. Seoul's chief nuclear envoy says that if Pyongyang is sincere and wants to talk about constructive stuff, South Korea is ready to retake its seat at the proceedings, our Hwang Sang-hee reports. South Korea is ready to return to the six-party nuclear talks. All North Korea has to do is show that it's serious about giving up its nuclear weapons. Following talks with its Russian counterpart in Moscow on Wednesday, South Korea's chief nuclear envoy, Hwang Jung-guk, said the five parties, including Russia and China, agree on the need for some preconditions for the multilateral dialogue. That, however, doesn't mean the North must take specific steps before returning to the negotiating table. Hwang said that beginning the talks without North Korea showing a sincere attitude about denuclearization would be meaningless. He added Pyongyang must show a willingness to engage in a constructive dialogue. The multilateral denuclearization talks involving the two Koreas, the U.S., China, Japan and Russia haven't been held since late 2008. But a recent flurry of diplomatic activity among the six parties has fueled hopes of getting the ball rolling again. Washington's new special representative for North Korea policy, Sung Kim, will meet with Huang in Seoul on Friday as part of a three-nation trip that also takes him to Japan and China. This while North Korean officials and American security experts are reportedly arranging a meeting in Singapore next month. Diplomatic sources say North Korea's chief nuclear negotiator, Lee Yong ho and former U.S. nuclear envoy Stephen Bosworth are among the likely attendees. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Now, Korea is going to mark a very solemn anniversary next March, the fifth anniversary of the fatal sinking of the Chonam warship. The vessel, which was torpedoed by North Korea, was recently moved to a park where it's going to be displayed for educational purposes. Our Che Yusun reports. Inside a park at the South Korean Navy Second Fleet headquarters south of Seoul now stands what remains of the Chonan warship, which was torpedoed by North Korea nearly five years ago. A $6 million project has placed the 1,200-ton vessel here from a nearby dock to show the very appearance of the Chonan cut into two pieces after the attack on March 26, 2010, which claimed the lives of 46 South Korean sailors. Visitors can get a wider view of the area atop a four-story high observatory and listen to the details of the tragedy before paying tribute to the sailors in front of a monument. The exhibition will become a sign of protecting our country, where a will for a victorious fight will be imprinted in the officers and people will be reminded about the value of security. In a bid to turn the painful memory into an opportunity to educate people about security, officials plan to build an additional memorial hall next year. I was heartbroken when we had to say goodbye to our children, but I'm thankful that the government has made efforts not to forget them. Some 830,000 Koreans and foreigners have visited the Chonan since it was displayed at the fleet's dock soon after the attack. Now the story of the ill-fated vessel can be told to more visitors at its new home. Choi Yusan, Arirang News. Time now for a look through the global headlines we're following on this Friday morning here in Seoul. For that, we turn to Eunice Kim, standing by at the News Centre. Good morning, Eunice. And good morning to you, Mark. Protests are expected to spread in the United States one day after a grand jury in New York returned with a decision not to press charges against a white officer who fatally choke held an unarmed black man. There are voices calling for a reform. President Barack Obama from Washington said too many Americans feel deep unfairness when it comes to the gap between professed ideals and how laws are applied on a day-to-day -day basis. 
And from Cleveland, outgoing Attorney General Eric Holder said it's time to take steps to improve community trust and policing, as he promised a comprehensive, swift, and independent federal inquiry into the Staten Island case. But a New York City police union told reporters Thursday 29 year old officer Daniel Pantaleo had acted properly in restraining Eric Garner on July 17th. Officer Pantaleo had testified he meant no harm when put, uh, putting Garner, who had a health issue, in a chokehold. Meanwhile, protests remained mostly peaceful as angry protesters chanted Garner's last known words, I can't breathe. There were some 30 arrests by Wednesday evening. Russia is having a difficult year, says President Vladimir Putin, and he urged his citizens to brace themselves for another difficult year ahead. In his annual address from the Kremlin, the Russian leader compared the current pressures from the West to the desire to destroy the state, likening it to Adolf Hitler, who invaded the country in 1941. President Putin also defended his decision to annex Ukraine's Crimea this spring, calling it a sacred Secret side to Russians, as is Jerusalem to Jews or Muslims. ECB President Mario Draghi spoke of more stepped up stimulus plans to revive the troubled Eurozone economy. The European Central Bank had announced it would hold interest rates at 0.05 percent on Thursday. Draghi, hinting that the ECB could buy government debt, said most measures could come, or rather, more measures could come after the bank reviews the impact of its current stimulus measures early next year. And finally, Toyota Motor Corporation has said it will call back 190,000 more cars to replace potentially defective airbags, though maker Takata has so far resisted a nationwide recall called by a U.S. safety agency. Following what it called an unprecedented crisis, Japan's regulator said it may have to change its recall system for an improved response. A Japanese ministry official said that if America's region recall was expanded to nation to the whole nation he would expect automakers in Japan to take similar action We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. Now, starting in the new year, Swedish furniture giant IKEA will stop selling a world map which refers to the body of water between Korea and Japan only by the Japanese name. Ahead of the opening of its first store in Korea this month, IKEA says it's decided to leave the map off its product lineup. The map, which caused quite the stir here in Korea, refers to the sea as Sea of Japan, as you can see there, but doesn't use the Korean name. EC, explaining the map was not intended to be used as an educational tool. The company apologized for upsetting its customers and employees. Now, while the overall Korean economy continues on the path to a moderate recovery, growth in income is not keeping pace, unfortunately. The figure rose in the third quarter by its slowest rate in well over two years. Reports. Korea has posted its slowest growth in income in two and a half years. The Bank of Korea says the national income edged up 0.3 percent in real terms in the third quarter from the previous one, the lowest expansion since the first quarter of 2012. The central bank attributes the slower growth to worsening trade conditions with export prices falling faster than import prices. Prices of outbound shipments dropped, while prices of IT products, which are one of Korea's major export items, fell. But experts say next quarter income figures could expand at a faster pace than the third quarter due to falling global oil prices. 
Oil prices dropped a lot in the fourth quarter, so trade conditions are likely to improve in the October to December period. Overall, economic activities remain on a recovery track as the country's gross domestic product grew 0.9 percent in the July to September period from the previous quarter. The third quarter figure matches an estimate made in late October and stands similar to the roughly 1 percent growth posted a year earlier. It also marks an improvement from half a percent growth in the second quarter. From a year earlier, however, the Korean economy grew 3.2 percent last quarter, slowing from 3.5 percent growth in the second quarter. Key indicators also point to a still sluggish economy, with facility investments down half a percent on quarter and exports falling more than 2 percent in the third quarter from a quarter earlier. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now, with uh, Korea's very heavy dependence on exports, the government has long stressed the importance of foreign direct investment. Free economic zones are dotted around the country to entice companies to lay some roots here, but Korea is having to raise its game now because of the amount of competition that's springing up around the region. Our Song Ji Son reports. To attract more foreign direct investment, Korea has established eight free economic zones over the past dozen years, with their total area amounting to 330 square kilometers, or half the size of Singapore. This one in Incheon was the first to be set up in 2003 and is the biggest of the eight. Foreign investors can receive tax exemptions and incentives when setting up their businesses in these free economic zones. BMW is one of many enjoying the benefits since building its first driving center in Asia at Incheon. It took years to choose the location through multiple feasibility tests, and we are fully satisfied with our decision. It's close to the capital and the metropolitan area. It's close to the airport, which enables us to provide maintenance service when our clients fly out. Korea seeks to become the center of East Asia in terms of investment by attracting more FDI in the eight free economic zones. But further deregulation is needed to fight rising competition within the region, as China and Taiwan also launched similar free trade zones last year. Uh, FDI coming into Korea, if you go back to 2003, it's gone up by about a factor of three. So it's good progress, um, roughly on a par with other countries in Asia, but good, uh, solid progress. The competition is there, though. I mean, I think that's key. Korea is not alone in doing this. The researcher also points out that inefficiencies in labor and financial markets are slowing things down, while Korea's infrastructure and high level of education stand out as advantages compared to its global competitors. Song ji Sun, Arirang News. Now, the steady warming of the tropical Pacific Ocean over the past two months has resulted in ocean surface temperatures reaching weak El Nino levels. In a news release Thursday, the World Meteorological Administration uh, organization rather, said there's a 70 percent chance a weak El Nino event will become established early next year. Now, El Nino is a warming of the equatorial Pacific Ocean that can drive weather changes around the world. And while the El Nino is expected to be weak, if it occurs at all, the weather organization warned that it's very unusual and alarming that vast areas of the ocean surface have shown higher temperatures this year, including in the normally cooler northern hemisphere. On the sidelines of the UN climate talks this week, the World Meteorological Organization said 2014 is on track to be one of the hottest years on record, citing the numerous droughts and floods reported around the globe. Last-minute touches are being put to a plant in Korea's southern port city of Busan that, in less than a month's time, will provide almost 50,000 tonnes of drinking water for the city every single day. For more on the nation's first desalination plant that will hopefully quench the city's thirst with previously undrinkable water, here's our Connie Lee. It's this seawater surrounding Korea's southern coast that's being turned into fresh, drinkable water. Korea now has its very first desalination plant 
built and ready to go for full operation starting in January. Located in the southern port city of Busan, the 175 million U.S. dollar plant can pump in about 100,000 tons of water per day from the ocean and remove the salt and turn it into 45,000 tons of fresh water, enough for about 150,000 residents in the city. This high-tech facility was built by Korea's very own Tucson Heavy Industries and Construction, currently the number one leader in the desalination plant market. Our company has been building these plants and working on desalination technology for about 40 years now. We built this one to help expand our overseas market and prepare for future water shortages. The purified water has been certified as safe to drink by the Pusan Water Authority, and the cost for consumers will be the same as fresh water from other sources. So is Korea facing a water shortage? Well, not right now, but potentially yes. According to a recent UN report, by the year 2030, nearly half of the global population will face water shortages due to demand exceeding water supply. The world is headed towards water shortages. Desalination plants are one way to fight water scarcity. And in the past two to three years, the number of these plants has grown tenfold. There are currently more than 16,000 desalination plants worldwide. And in the face of water scarcity, that number is expected to increase in the years to come. Connie Lee, Arirang News, Busan. And TGI Friday, everyone, as we kick things off with Formula One racing, as it was announced that the Korean Grand Prix will return in the 2015 F1 calendar, but it is still to be confirmed. Now, with the Korean Grand Prix being left off the schedule this past season due to financial problems, the latest provisional schedule for the 2015 season has Korean Grand Prix returning once again. However, the latest change is still marked at to be confirmed, as it is unsure whether the race will return to Yangham or if it will be the solar street circuit idea that is being pushed for by former race promoter Joe Chung. Meanwhile, if the race does return to Korea, it's scheduled for May 3rd instead of the usual October dates. And now shifting over to golf, where the annual Korea-Japan Women's Golf Tournament is set to take place this weekend as golf stars from both nations are set to compete in a two-day tournament starting on Sunday. Now with the tournament taking place for the 12th time, Korea has a winning record against Japan with six wins, two draws and three losses so far as some of the biggest names in the LPGA, KLPGA and the JLPGA are set to compete in Japan. Now, some of the names include world number one Park Yun Bi, Ri So Yun, Kim Hyo Ju, and Shin Ji Ae, who has been dominating over in the JLPGA. And now, moving over to football this time, and the KFA's technical conference was kicked off on Thursday. Now, highlighting the conference was the national team head coach Uli Stilike, who held his first presentation, stressing the importance of flexibility. Now, the hour-long lecture, which was spoken in Spanish, focused mainly on head coaches learning to be flexible on the bench and learning to change the strategy during the match. The 60-year-old argued that coaches shouldn't be held back by what he called SOS, as in system, organization, and scheme. Now, Stilicke, who showed such flexibility in his coaching, is 2-2 two two so far in the four matches he's coached with the Korean national team. And finishing things off, but staying with the KFA's technical conference, a couple of technical committee members had their presentation on the reasons for why Korea failed to advance in the 2014 Brazil World Cup. And they came up with two reasons. Now, one of the reasons pointed out by Anik Su, a member of the technical committee, was the lack of movement from the players. He stated that the players moved less than the opposing teams in all three group stage matches, adding that one of Germany's reasons for success was their players moving around far more than their opponents. Meanwhile, Chung tae suk cited lack of efficiency as another reason for why the national team did poorly in Brazil. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Well, today is going to be the coldest day of the season. The lower and central parts of the nation.
plummeted to near minus 10 overnight, and it's really freezing outside right now. Uh, strong winds make it feel colder, so be sure to dress warmer before heading out today. The western coastal regions will have to deal with more snowfall. Up to 20 centimeters will more of snow will fall in parts of Chungcheongdo and Jeollado provinces, so uh, please be safe. In the meantime, the other areas should have mostly sunny skies throughout the day, but it will not push the temperatures to the mild side, as the afternoon temperature in Seoul will only hike up to minus 3, while Daegu and Gwangju peak at 2, and Busan will top out at 5 this afternoon. And as for the other regions, Jeju will be getting up to 6, while Daejeon and Dukdo see highs of minus 1 and 1, respectively. Now, it feels like minus 15 here in Seoul this this morning, so bundle up. That's all for now. Back to you, Mark, in the studio. Well, thank you very much, Gion, for the weather the air there. And uh, that's all we have for now. Korea Today is coming up at the top of the hour, 7 a.m. Korea time. Have a great day and a fabulous weekend. Goodbye.